Okay, so we're making some progress. We've already gotten two games in. For those of you um, recently joining, this is a third speedrun in which essentially... And it's very similar to the first two, I'm not going to lie. But uh, the, the idea here is to play very traditional conservative openings. At least until I'm 12 or 1300 and really get deep into the fundamentals. Because I think one of the comments from my previous ones has been that sometimes I tend to win fast out of the opening, especially in the earlier games. And I wanted to sort of rectify that this time. I'm not saying I'm not going to win quick games, but we're going to try to emphasize middle game, middle game play and, and, and fundamentals. All right, let's go. We're playing a 1400, so we've played up a couple of games now. But uh, that's fine with me. And we are playing absolute classical openings. Queen's Gambit declined with black. E4, E5. Okay, so this is this is the Queen's Gambit declined, uh, which I recommend to, to every beginner. It's it's sort of a gateway opening for, for a lot of other stuff. And in this position, the traditional move is Bishop E7, but if you want to play with a little bit of an edge... Uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with this move, knight b to d7, which looks like it blunders a pawn, and you'll be surprised at how many people fall into this trap. C takes d5, and then knight takes d5. Um, but then, after knight takes d5, bishop takes queen, there's bishop b4 check, and black wins a piece. I'll show that after the game. This is a very, very famous trap that's been around for a very, very long time. e3 is, of course, the main move, and now we develop our bishop to e7. Why e7 and not d6? Well, mostly because white is pinning us. So now white is threatening to win this pawn. So it's it's time for us to unpin. Okay. Now we would like to complete our development with castle short. Our kingside development at least. And then we have to decide what to do with this bishop. Now there's a couple of ways to play this type of position. A couple of ways to play this type of position. Um, and, and, and this line has been around since, you know, the 1800s. Um, a lot of people like to play b6 and bishop b7. Perfectly perfectly reasonable line. But I'm going to show you guys a, a system that I only know by the Russian name, which roughly translates to uh, the simplifying system of Capablanca. So this was introduced to me by my coach many years ago. I am entirely clueless as to modern theory. I haven't played this myself since I was 1600, so get take this with a grain of salt. The move looks bad. I'm going to warn you. The move looks bad. It looks passive. You play c6. Okay. Now you might say, all right, c6. Maybe it doesn't look that bad, but it does leave this bishop per pretty hemmed in. Never play c6. Now we do something which might seem even more paradoxical. We take on c4. Now notice that I have waited for white to move his light squared bishop once, uh, now I take on c4 and essentially I win a tempo. And here, once again, there are two setups that I'm familiar with. One involves a more aggressive move b5 and then bishop b7. But the Capablanca system that I uh, that that I was referring to, does anybody know what I'm referring to? What move leads to essentially force simplification to some degree? And don't worry, this is not a draw or anything like that. Well, a5 is not a simplifying move. No, c5, also not a simplifying move. I'm looking for peace trades. Knight d5, yeah. Knight d5 is the simplifying move. It invites a trade of dark squared bishops. We'll, of course, recapture with a queen to keep the knight on a stronghold. And I think the great thing about this system is it really, it really teaches you how pieces and pawns work. Because at first sight, black's position seems to be quite a bit worse. Passive bishop. White has more central control. White can play e4 at some point, even now. But in reality, the position is very close to equal. Now, a lot of this has to do with the lack of weaknesses in black's position. This is a very underrated thing uh, that people don't always realize. When you don't have any weaknesses, I mean, your position is going to be very hard to crack. Even if... Even if... Uh, your position is very passive. 
All right, that's just a fact about chess that, that you have to factor in. Now we continue to simplify. We continue to simplify. And the other thing about this type of structure is that we can uncoil our pawns with a timely e5. Uh, e5 immediately blunders the pawn, right? Because the knight on d5 is going to be left insufficiently protected. So we take on c3 first, and then we expand with e5. We kind of uncoil, and later we can open our bishop and develop it along this diagonal. So e5, this is essentially, as far as I know, the position is very balanced. Let's see if we can win, if we can win the resulting position, which is very simple. Okay, d takes e5, knight takes e5. This guy is playing very well, I have to say. He's playing great moves. So let's see whether we can make something happen in this position. So I think it's clear that black has essentially equalized. The only thing that remains is for us to get our bishop out. Bishop e6 is good to neutralize white's bishop. If I were white, I would be contemplating a move like queen b3 to discourage bishop e6. Yeah, f4 is not scary. f4, we drop our queen back. And f4 doesn't really scare us that much. Once again, black's position is so solid. No targets. White's position too, but we're playing black, so we're, we're obviously trying to equalize out of the opening. Okay, queen c2. And we have two distinct ways to develop our bishop. Bishop e6 I mentioned previously. The other one is, of course, to play bishop f5 with tempo. But again, the way we're playing in the speedrun is just to emphasize very simple chess and, and fundamentals, even if it means getting into a drawn position. Even if it means getting into a drawn position. So let's complete our development. We fully equalize. Of course, we want to take with a queen. We don't want to ruin our pawn structure. And I'm, I'm actually hoping that he plays queen b3 because I want to play an endgame. So what's our next moves going to... What is our next se sequence of moves going to be? We're probably going to go rook d8. It's a good idea to create some luft, and that is a lapse in concentration by our opponent. Who can tell me why? It's a free pawn. Now, before taking such a pawn, you just verify that your queen isn't getting trapped. Always a necessary step because... Okay, queen takes a2, he can play rook a3, but our queen safely returns back to e6, the square where it came from. Thank you very much for the pawn. Right, now we need to be careful. So, who wants to propose a move here? Yeah, so some of you are proposing g6, which is a good move. But it allows rook d7. I don't want to allow rook d7. So the move rook fd8 comes to mind. But if you calculate rook fd8, he can trade. And then he can play the move rook to a3, forking the queen and the a pawn. All right, and just these queen side pawns you got to be very careful about. So I propose a, a much simpler move, which is just to return with the queen to e6. And you guys are getting it. Back to e6. I guess I'm allowing rook d3, so... It's not entirely clear, but still. Yeah, rook d3, good, good stuff by, by my opponent. All right, so how do we deal with this? He wants rook d7. We can't stop it by playing rook d8. So what we need to do is ask ourselves, all right, after he goes rook d7, what do we want to be able to play? Like we don't necessarily want to go rook b8. That's very passive. I'll talk about passive and active defense afterward. But there is a, a, a relatively common technique for dealing with a rook infiltration to the seventh rank. Okay, the, this is sort of a something that you can kind of commit to memory, and that is the move rook f e8 first, with the idea of meeting rook d7 with rook e7. Essentially forcing, and very important detail, of course, rook d8 is not made. We take it and we drop the rook back to e8. 
Rook D6. This guy is good. <laughs> this guy is no joke. All right. Let's think. I was planning Queen E5 in this position. I think Queen E5 is just fine. Oh, he's got something crazy there. Let me just think. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out. Maybe it's actually Nepo. Queen C8 or Queen E5. Let's go Queen E5. Queen B3. Another excellent move. Preparing Rook D7. Now, Queen F5 we can take. I think Queen B5. B5, Rook D8, Rook E8. Yeah, Queen B5. Let's go Queen B5. Again, not blundering mate. Rook D8 check. We have a Rook E8. At the first opportunity, I'm going to create some Luft. Yeah, I don't see like a mate or anything here. I hope I'm not blundering something. Now, notice the X-ray defense, right? Notice the X-ray defense. Okay, now we're up a pawn. I'm happy. The problem is that he's got this super active rook. First of all, we have to defend this pawn. I, I don't see a reason to just give it away. So let's go rook A to B8. We could have also gone B6, but rook D5, we have to defend this pawn. He's not leaving me with much choice. Ah, very nicely played. Rook C5 and then rook C7. Yeah, so this is going to be a draw because we have to prevent the rook from doubling on the seventh rank. So let's go rook bc8, basically allowing him to take b7. Now let's create some luft with uh, g6, for example. And I'm going to do my best to win this, actually. Now, who can give me a clever move here? We have a very clever move. It doesn't really work, but it's a good try. Yeah, we can give him a check first and then go rook c2. Or we can go rook a1. We can try to be we can try to be fancy. Let's go rook c2 and let's hope he doesn't... Yeah, okay, he does fine. g3. All right, now we take it and it's a draw. We can go h5 here just to create the ideal pawn structure. Push the b pawn. Rook b1. We're just going to try to push the b pawn all the way and see what happens. Sometimes people mess up in those positions. Let's give him a check on b2. You see he's already not... Okay, so he... What is he doing? Now he's just giving up all the pawns. And now he's giving up another one. We can win this pawn with rook g3. Yeah, very... I mean, honestly, very strange play. Because he was playing excellent, and then he just gave everything up and resigned. Accuracy was nice. 90 to 97. No, I think he's legit. I, I just, just think he's good. I don't know what to say. Okay. All right. All right, guys. Let's take a look at the game. Let's take a look at the game. Okay, so... Queen's Gambit decline. Now, the line here, C takes D5, E takes D5, Knight takes D5. Remember this. Knight takes D5. Bishop takes Queen, and Bishop B4 check. It's not mate. He's got Queen D2. You can either take on D8 or take on D2, and at the end of the day, you're up a piece. Um, I've seen some 15, 1600s fall into this, by the way. So Knight PD7 is a great way to make an, a theoretical move while also setting a trap. While also setting a trap. Okay? Um, E3, Bishop E7. Knight F3, castles, Rook C1. Well, again, there's multiple moves in this position. B6 is one of them. Um... Let me see. C6 is the main move, 2,100 uh, games. So we, we followed the main line, DC4, and Knight D5. Yeah, this is over 1,000 games in this position, so it's a very reputable system. This is all main line. Now, if he goes E4, then we take on C3, and who can tell me, let's say, Rook takes C3, how Black should respond here? And this is one of the main ideas of, of the line, of course. Not queen b4. So queen b4 is tempting but very superficial, right? Think about it this way. Is the black queen operating alone going to really cause a lot of damage? For example, queen c2. I want to remind you of an important point I made in the first speedrun. How do you assess whether pins are dangerous? So there's two factors you have to consider. The first, 
Thank you, Great Odin's Raven, for the five gift. The first factor is whether the pinned piece is defended by a pawn. If it is, pins are generally less dangerous. That should be intuitive, right? Because if this rook wasn't defended by a pawn, it would be a lot more vulnerable. The second is how temporary is the pin likely to be? Pins against the king, that is, if the king is at the end of the pin, not the pin piece, but I call it the, uh, the pin-y, um, and the king is likely to castle on the next move, then the pin loses, you know, its value greatly. So here, white's going to castle on the next move. White can also play a3, b4. And that's why queens aren't very good at delivering pins or at holding pins because they're so easy to chase away. So this doesn't do anything. Whoops, my bad. Um, any other attempts? Yeah, so Chris Mastronic got it. The move here is e5. We have to contest the center. We have to contest the center. And our pieces, notice how perfectly poised they are. They're both controlling e5. And in the event of a trade, black is in excellent shape here. We're attacking e4. We can go bishop e6. Just because white is a little bit more space in the center doesn't mean white's better. All right, so space advantage itself is not a reason to be overly concerned. How can I choose between e5 and c5? Well, that's a good question. I mean, it's like c5 is not that dumb here either. c5 is an interesting move. But but here's my problem with c5. I'm going to castle and ignore you. And then you can trade in the center. I'll give you that. Thank you, Mulha's gifting to create, create on its raven. But the problem is that you haven't solved the underlying issue of your bishop. I feel like e5 not only breaks in the center, but also opens up the diagonal for black slide squared bishop. Okay, so... Generally, in these positions, I would prefer e5. So he castles. This is still the main line. Knight c3, rook c3, 5, 600 games. d5, knight e5, knight e5, queen e5. And yeah, f4 is the most popular move. Queen c2 has about 11 games. Yeah, so bishop e6, of course. Bishop f5 is also perfectly fine. And of course, here, rook d1 was a very surprising move. Uh, I was expecting a3. Why don't we want our bishop on b7? Well, we can, yeah, we can put our bishop on b7. You can play b6, but this is just a little bit passive. This is just a little bit passive. There are like 30 games in this line. Queen c2, bishop b7, but you can get in a little bit of trouble. Bishop d3, h6, bishop e4, and you're going to have a hard time defending this pawn. So it's just a little bit passive to Fianchetto in this position. Okay, so rook d1, he allows us to take the pawn. h3... Yeah, and here, I don't know if I if I really played this accurately, but again, rook fd8 takes, takes, rook a3 wins the pawn back, right? Um, so that's not very satisfactory. A lot of you were suggesting g6, but that lets the rook get into d7 immediately. also don't like that, so that's why I played queen e6. But rook cd3 is a very nice move. Okay, so man of the raid, thank you. I'm about to end, but I appreciate it. I really appreciate it, man. And good, good, good games. I am about to finish, though. Okay, so rookie eight, rookie seven is something that you should remember. And people had questions at this point. I don't know what they were. Rook d6 is another excellent move, basically forcing the queen onto an awkward square. And this move loses because of rook d8 check. Why not queen g6, asks Alexander Eve after rook e6. So it's the same exact principle that I shared earlier. You have a pin going against white's queen, but it's very easy to eradicate. It's just a one-move threat. I call it one-move-itis, where you think that, you know, okay, I'm stopping rook d7, but white's just going to reinforce the threat with a move like queen b3. Your queen might be out of the game here. I think maybe queen g6 is better, but... You're not going to stop rook d7 with that move. Okay. So a lot of people would make the mistake of just automatically going rook a b8. This is the definition of being passive, right? Passive position means you have a lot of pieces that are either in a defensive role or just not doing anything. And I, I don't like the situation. White gets in with the other rook. This can get... Pretty annoying. Yeah, but b6 again, rook d6, and now you lose the c6 pawn. So I actually think this is the most accurate. Here, here, queen b3 is a great move, aiming at the b7 pawn. So 
I wouldn't think of it in terms of good versus, well, you could think of it in terms of good versus bad, but sometimes passive can be good, right? If you're defending, for example, you might have a fortress and that's another way of saying passive defense, right? You just bring all your pieces back, you set up a fortress, and then you start moving back and forth. That's an example of successful passive defense. There's no simple answer to the question. Mo yeah, most of the time you want to play actively and you want to defend actively. Well, h6 is necessary as soon as possible. The problem is that I don't get a chance to play. Because if I go h6, he goes rook d7. This is what I was worried about, at least. And for some reason, I thought I have to take the rook. In reality, I don't. And I think the move b5 gives black a pretty good position here. So maybe queen b5 was premature. So in any case, we have this big trade. Rook d8, rook, b, rook d5. A6, rook c5, and here I'm forced to give up a pawn because of the possibility of rook c7, and we certainly don't want to allow doubling on the c file. By the way, if I'd gone with this rook, white has the very cute rook takes b7 tactic, just something to keep in mind. So, not good. Rook bc8, rook takes, rook takes, rook takes b7. And, of course, this should have ended in a draw. This is just a dead draw, but he went the wrong way. I mean, already king d2 is just weird. I mean, if he just... Sorry, if he just chills on f3, black is never going to be able to move the rook away from b1. This is a dead draw. And neither side can make progress here. I mean, you've seen this a million times. So this would have been a draw, but I don't know. If he just totally collapses here, king d2, we give a check. Here, white should have brought the king back to e1. Probably still a draw, but this just loses all of the pawns. So a bit of an anticlimactic end to the game. Kind of weird, but uh, definitely I'm glad we got a chance to play this opening. It's a very solid system. And I'm going to bore you guys to death for the next 500 points of the speedrun. Just playing super solid, you know, kind of conservative stuff. And, and that's what we're going to work on the speedrun is building those very basic fundamentals. Because trust me, if you want to play like tall or you want to play aggressively, building up your ability to play boring positions, in my opinion, is an absolute prerequisite. So hopefully you'll find that instructive. We're just getting started. But right now I'm going to go to bed, guys. Fun day. A lot of bullet. Got to 3,300 at the end of the day, and we did a speedrun game. So nice, productive stream. I'll definitely stream tomorrow, probably earlier in the day, maybe after the World Championship. And in the meantime, I am going to raid my friend Zura Javahadze at Let's Chess Live. He's an international master living in Texas. Good friend of mine. Uh, so enjoy his stream, giving me love. Thank you guys for hanging out. Thank you, Selway, for the sub. Have a great night. See you guys later. Bye.